Good afternoon to you. Mark Seth of HurricaneTrack.com here with your off-season edition of the Hurricane Outlook and Discussion. It is now Monday, March 23rd, 2020. And, uh, you know, despite everything that's going on, we cannot ignore weather as a whole, severe weather, and, of course, hurricanes in particular. That is my area of expertise, and that's what we're going to keep talking about. We're going to keep it as level as we can. You know, we're not going to be fear-mongering and scaring people with a forecast of doom and gloom, but just the facts. That's what I've done, and that's what I'm going to continue to do, but I want to emphasize that we cannot ignore the fact that hurricane season is a little over two months away, and it may have some bearing on what we're dealing with in our current situation, dealing with this pandemic. We're not going to discuss that right now because I'm really not qualified to do so, but there will be potentially a time when the two disciplines intersect, the world of the pandemic and the world of hurricanes. We can deal with that. Hopefully we won't have to, but at a later time. But it's very important to focus uh, you know, on what's coming and uh, not neglect it, um, but not obsess over it either. So here we are, the off-season edition, continuing on here as we round out the month of March. We will take a look starting off with uh, vorticity. I'm going to use this a lot during hurricane season. This shows us different areas where energy is congregating and uh, trying to bundle up and become, in the case of the tropics, a tropical cyclone. And as you can see, there's really not much down there. These little small impulses here and there, uh, not amounting to much, but they're starting to increase. There's just a little bit more in the way of convection energy gathering in the tropics and I love this chart because you can just watch this evolve over time whereas now most of the energy is still up here in the higher latitudes with our mid-latitude storm systems embedded in the jet stream etc this will start to go away and this will start to increase over time we'll start to uh, track tropical waves and so just get used to this chart if you're just tuning into my videos for the first time this is called the vorticity chart and we will be looking at this quite often in the months ahead, but at least for now, nice and quiet for the most part down in the tropics. All right, on to uh, sea surface temperature anomalies, departures from normal. I think what stands out the most here, you can clearly see uh, in the Atlantic Basin over here, most of the sea surface temperatures are running above normal. Uh, Half a degree Celsius, a quarter of a degree, in some cases more than a degree Celsius, like right off the coast of Africa, the Gulf of Mexico, Western Atlantic. So on the whole, the Atlantic is warmer than average, especially in the deep tropics, uh, you know, south of the higher latitudes. Way up in the North Atlantic, still running below average, but boy, down in the tropics, etc., uh, quite a bit above average. Uh, even if it doesn't sound like much, a half a degree or a degree Celsius is a lot of extra energy. And in the uh, Pacific, though, Watch this over time. This is really going to start to erode away these warm anomalies that are present through here. And then there's some there right along the equator. A few warm anomalies. I mean, the Nino 3.4 is still running a half a degree to 0.6 above right now, but we're getting ready to lose that. I'm very confident in that, and I'll show you why I think that in just a moment. I want to show you this, though. This is the CDAS data coming out of the Gulf of Mexico. It's just a different satellite measuring methodology for sea surface temperature anomalies. Uh, This is off the Tropical Tidbit site. And look at this, man. Uh, You know, wow. 1.51 for the Gulf of Mexico above average. That's the anomaly value for today. And you can see this big jump as of late. Um, And the Gulf of Mexico is where early season development would happen. When you get into June, this is the primary area that we watch right through here. And with this being such a, uh, an anomaly right now and nothing to, I mean, winter's done. We're not going to have any more Arctic intrusions, no cold air advection events. In fact, probably going to see record high temperatures across parts of the Gulf Coast later in the week and into the weekend. You know, don't want to worry people, but we're going to have to watch this, you know, over the next couple of months. It's really going to start to matter and it could be a concern. You know, we have to just keep that in the back of our minds with everything else that's going on, that there are some features here that we need to pay attention to and make sure that we don't ignore uh, with all the other stuff that's going on. So interesting to see this big spike 
in the Gulf of Mexico. All right, subsurface is what I'm talking about. The days of the warm pool right here are numbered. A very large and substantial uh, cold pool has developed across a vast portion of the central to western Pacific subsurface. A very pronounced area of subsurface cooling is taking place is taking place in the eastern Pacific and we get enough of an easterly wind burst coming across the top if you understand how this works uh, this is the east over here and this is the west and we're looking at a slice through the tropical Pacific kind of like if we took a slice right through this area right through here and looked down in the vertical this is what that would look like and all this cold is going to make its way up to the surface eventually. I won't say all of it, but we're headed towards a cool neutral to maybe weak La Nina. And that is reflected in the modeling. This is the latest from the late, I'm sorry, the mid-March uh, IRI. That's the International Research Institute Climate Prediction Center. Uh, Model-based, probabilistic ENSO forecast. In other words, will there be an El Nino or not? And if we look at the August, September, October window here, the peak of hurricane season, neutral uh, is the most likely right now, at just under 50% probability. I suspect that this will really start to go up as this moves closer into time this way. And that's what happens. You know, as we started out back in January, the ASO August, September time period was way over here. And as this moves forward into time, meaning that it'll go to the left, as this gets updated every couple of weeks, uh, I suspect this gray bar and maybe even the blue bar will go up as the red bar will go down. The odds of El Nino are really starting to diminish. And I think that that's going to lead to uh, Dr. Phil Klotzbach and his Colorado State University, he and his colleagues there, issuing more than likely a forecast for above normal activity when that forecast comes out in the early part of April, they were supposed to uh, release that, I think April 2nd or 3rd, something like that. And Dr. Klotzbach was going to do so down at the National Tropical Weather Conference in South Padre Island. But of course, all conferences have been canceled, at least the in-person version of those conferences. Um, but it is my belief that we will be looking at an above normal hurricane season based on this data and other factors, the warm Atlantic, etc. Um, and we cannot ignore that. You know, we don't want to obsess over it, but it's coming, okay? We got to stay, you know, keep that in mind. Um, so, this data, look at all these numbers here. I was going back and looking through this data here from, um, I don't know, like what you call this. this is the Golden Gate Weather Services. And uh, I just found this as a nice chart of the ONI values. It's a good measurement of El Nino or La Nina. Now, if you just go back and look at some of the busier hurricane seasons in the modern era, all right? So 1995 was a very busy season. It's all blue. You know, we were either in weak to strong La Nina. 96, the year 1996 into 97, weak uh, La Nina, cold neutral, weak La Nina. Those were two busy seasons right there, 95 and 96. 97, of course, massive El Nino uh, 98, 99, we got into La Nina for a period of time, and these were all very busy hurricane seasons. What about 04? Well, in 04, uh, the third column here is August, September, October, that time frame. In 04, we actually had what you could argue was El Nino conditions, but 05, August, September, October of 05, it was weak La Nina. You see where I'm going with this. That weak La Nina seems to be the key there. When you really overwhelm the system with strong values on the positive or the negative, it tends to kind of skew things. It's that weak, neutral, cold neutral to weak La Nina where we seem to get the most hits on the United States. And here's another example. 08, August, September, October of 08, 0.3 below. So weak La Nina, cold neutral to weak La Nina. And 2009, we had an El Nino. 2010, strong La Nina, lots of hurricanes, none hit the United States. And then you go and just look further out here. 2014, slightly warm, and you know we had uh, a moderate season that year. But then look, 16, 2016 was a fairly busy year, uh, and we had fairly substantial La Nina conditions there. But what about 17? 
We all remember that. You know, slightly weak La Nina, and then 1920 we were just slightly El Nino. So it's those borderline, like, again, when you don't have those strong cattle prod shock to the system, strong El Nino, strong La Nina, it's those areas around neutral, slightly warmer, slightly colder, that we tend to have the most hits on the United States. And you can go back through this chart. You see right there what the URL is, and you can check these out yourself. And it does actually go all the way back to uh, 1950 for what it's worth. And we don't have the satellite data and other data as, as like we do now, obviously going back that far. But you look at the data, you match it up, and you can get the idea that when I see this, that we're headed towards an August, September, October time frame that favors uh, neutral, you know, I won't say that I'm worried because we don't approach it that way, but you have to pay attention to that. All right, so there you go. All right, now, lower 48 weather, that's the other aspect of the off-season uh, video discussion here. Really the only thing of note is uh, a brief winter reprise up here, you know, coming back into winter for a little bit. Uh, some snow, it's good to see some snow video instead of all these charts and dire graphics and whatever. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Seeing some snow video today coming out of the northeast, and it's, it's actually kind of nice to see that. Kind of calm out west for the most part. A few windy conditions here in New Mexico, parts of Colorado. But no major storm systems coming up, and we can see that reflected very nicely in the convective outlooks from the Storm Prediction Center. Again, keeping you hurricane ready and weather aware. Weather and hurricanes, they're all the same. Hurricanes are obviously like the Super Bowl of weather. Uh, but this is kind of like your preseason or your warm-up, you know, severe weather season. Slight risk of severe weather today in parts of uh, the nation's midsection, but no big-time dire, like, oh, my gosh, like we really need that kind of stuff in terms of severe weather coming up, which is good, you know, just run-of-the-mill garden variety severe weather threats that you need to take them seriously but this is you know obviously it could be much worse that's my point and then it kind of tapers off towards the end of the week coming up and then the next four to eight days at least the probability and the predictability etc is too low so if you have severe weather concerns luckily it's not too widespread for now all right so i've got some good news for you let's have some good news for a change shall we move me up here. Um, this is something that I'm going to start next Wednesday. I think it's April 1st, right? A week from this Wednesday. Next Wednesday, April 1st. Uh, and that's called Hurricane U. Hurricane University. That's what that's all about. That's what that little logo there. Make a nice t-shirt, wouldn't it? Um, what is it? It was going to be originally a Patreon exclusive that I would eventually put out on YouTube. But considering what we're dealing with and the concept of the greater good, I'm going to just do it live. And what is it? Well, uh, essentially, it's going to be like a master class and educational series that I'm going to do live that is supported by our patrons on Patreon. And I'll talk about that more in a minute. So starting Wednesday, April 1st, I'm going to set up something in my office, all the kids at home, uh, notwithstanding, that's going to make it interesting because it's going to be live. Um, I'm going to launch this Hurricane U uh, initiative. And so each week, every Wednesday, not sure exactly what time, probably in the afternoon, 2, 3 o'clock, something like that, for about an hour, we're just going to start at the beginning. Why do we have hurricanes? Like Hurricanes 101. You know, we're going to talk, and everything will be very specific, like a classroom setting. And I'm going to try to get experts, guests, to appear via Skype or FaceTime, and we will all learn something. So, as an example, Hurricanes 101. Why do we even have them? What are the seasons about? What are the ingredients necessary? That will be a very specific set of what we talk about, like on day one. Uh, as an example, we'll again talk about computer models. That'll be its own class, if you will, of Hurricanes 101, or, or I'm sorry, Hurricane U, and I will get an expert that knows about computer models. You know, we'll work on that. I don't know everything, so I'm going to pull in the people that can help us. We'll talk about 
um, you know, what they do in the Hurricane Hunter airplanes. And I know a few people I can talk to about that. We will talk about preparedness. We will talk about insurance. And yes, I will get an insurance person on. And we will talk about mitigation. We're going to have this universe of our world here of hurricanes. That's what my channel is all about. And I'm going to do it live, for better or for worse, uh, and make it available for everybody. It will not be monetized. There will be no ads of any kind. And it will be supported by these fine people here on Patreon. We have about 248 patrons right now. And this is how we're going to do it. I look at it like public radio. And again, serving the greater good. Uh, this will be good for everybody. It will be a good, fun learning experience. And how can you become a member? Well, you just go to patreon.com slash hurricane track. I'll put the link in the description of today's video, of course. But just for a dollar, I mean, I've got like 21,000 YouTube subscribers, 32,000 Twitter followers. You know, if just a quarter of those folks did the one dollar thing, I could get rid of the other tiers completely, and I'd be good to go for funding. But it's not just about the funding. It's about allowing me to be able to do what I do in the field, this educational thing, the Hurricane U, and our original content. So uh, if you join up on Patreon and support what we're doing, you get access to the podcast that I've been doing since December, the new Stories from the Hurricane Highway, um, all the way to uh, all of our original series, like the Hurricane Highway television series I'm working on. There's episode three. It's already dropped. Barry, I'm working on episodes four and five now. And Dorian is in there. Um, and just all this other content, it's it's incredible. What a great community. And it's all available, you know. And get ready for the hurricane season because we're going to do a lot here on Patreon that I could never do in an app of my own. And it's all community fu uh, funded. You know, the world of crowdfunding, what an amazing thing. So there you go. Patreon.com slash hurricane track. If you're interested uh, you know, like Netflix or Disney Plus or whatever, you get something in return. So it's it's worth the investment, and it allows me to continue to do what I do. All right, so thank you all for that support. Our current patrons uh, and everybody that has, uh, you know, done their thing over the years to support what I've been doing here on my side of the screen so that you can enjoy the benefits on your side of the screen. We are all definitely in this together, whether it's the weather that ties us together, <coughs> allergies, um, and at least it rained last night, so we washed some of that out of the air. Or this virus pandemic. You know, we're all in this together, so I thank you very much. Even just watching the video, you know, means a lot to me, so I appreciate it. All right, well, that's it. Uh, we're not too far away from these becoming more frequently, the, these videos. And, you know, like I said, next week, this is going to be live, or, yeah, next week, next Wednesday. And then when we get into May... We'll start doing these a couple times a week and really looking at the hurricane season ahead. So buckle up. You know, weather season, severe weather season is here. We can't deny it. I'll do my best to stay on top of it and keep you informed. All right, that is it for me. As always, thank you for your time and uh, attention on your side of the screen. I appreciate it more than you know. I am Mark Suttoth, HurricaneTrack.com. I'll be with you at least twice next week. Talk to you then.